Welcome back, everyone. Stories of the Week is brought to you by Anapsis, the leading provider of solutions to protect ERP systems from cyber attacks. Customers can secure their SAP and Oracle business critical platforms from espionage, sabotage, and financial fraud risks. Visit them on the web at anapsis.com. And by Pony Express. Check out the Community Edition and turn your Nexus 7 into a lean and mean pen testing machine. For all those hard to reach places, there's Pony Express. Visit them on the web at ponyexpress.com. Don't forget to register for Source Boston coming up April 25th through the 28th in Boston, of course. Source Conference will be there. We'll be selling t shirts. It's going to be a lot of fun. Are you going to be there, Israel? Source? Yep. Okay, good. See, then we'll be at a conference together. It won't be RSA, <laughs> but, you know, it's Source is awesome. It's a lot of fun. Cool. Excellent. All righty. Mike and Kevin, are you guys ready to talk? Now, I sent everyone this one story. And when I sent it, Mike said, I knew you were going to say you wanted to talk <laughs> about the story, so I printed it out. I'm not sure why you, you, you printed it. <laughs> I don't really own a printer anymore. He's serious. He's really I'm serious. Very serious. About it. You wanted to read it in the bathroom? I understand. You can do that on your I like smartphone. to highlight. I like if to you're going to kill a tree, it's got to be pretty serious. That's right. That's right. Trees grow back? I live in the land of the pines. They grow back. They do, Trust they me. do grow back. Yes. It was a pretty long article, too, so you killed a pretty serious tree with this one, Mike. <laughs> you killed yeah, it, it, it takes some paper. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mike, I wanna, can you start by giving us the, the, the premise of this story? This is by Gunnar Peterson uh, from the uh, one Raindrop blog, which I love to pull articles from his blog to talk about yep. on the show. He was a oh, guest. Oh, he's got great stuff. I awesome mean, it's, stuff. It's, he was um, a guest on this show once as well. Fantastic insights I find into security. One of the best out there, uh, in fact. In this article, I mean, he was like, he went all out, dude. I mean, he was like, security, go. And yeah. And yeah, so here's what I like about it. Perspectives, right? right? Yeah, so it's it's security fast and slow, which is which is uh, riffing off of the the book by the same title. And in the, the book, it's funny. I started the book, um, and I haven't finished it yet. But he talks uh, in it. The, the author of Thinking Fast and Slow talks about different systems for thinking. You've got like a Type One and a Type Two. Yeah, he calls it System One described. and System One and System Two, and, which and were predecessors to, to System Seven, but that's different. <laughs> of course. Uh, and in system one, right, it's it's fast, it's intuitive, it's frequent, it's emotional. It's the stuff that we just kind of, you know, you ask the question and somebody answers it. Whereas system two is the slow, it requires more effort, it requires more energy, uh, and that's all neat. But but here's where I think, I, I and I love this, because a lot of times people take their best stuff and they bury it. A lot of the editing that I do, you know, there's a really great idea and it takes forever to get to it. And mm. in this particular piece... If you read nothing more than the first five paragraphs or six paragraphs, man, you nailed it. Because mm -hmm. what I love about this is um, he starts with this, with this quote from Roger Needham. We systems people regard the users in any code they wrote as the mortal enemies in us, of us and each other. We were like the police force in a violent slum. And he said, you know, that's interesting because if you look at it, that's what we're doing in InfoSec today. And then he had, and I love this, but, and this very much builds on the, the whole interviews of the evening. And I'm, that, you know, and I'm not big on quotes, but he nailed it here. No, yeah, and this next yeah. one, right? The quote, the, the measure of success is not whether you have a tough problem to deal with, but whether it's the same problem you had last year. And, and I knew you were going to jump on that one, too. Well, because I'm the guy yeah. that runs around and says, for all you guys have done for security awareness, are we still dealing with passwords? Oh, ha, <laughs> ha. <laughs> yes. Yes, we are. Then you didn't solve the problem. Like if we keep doing the same things over and over, right? Uh, didn't Einstein define that as lunacy? And, and mm -hmm. so it just I think he lays it out really well. Um, you know, and, and he, he went better. He, he looked at the OWASP top 10 and he said, look, when people say, why didn't it change? He's yeah, like, I like well, how Hoff asks, why doesn't the OWASP top 10 ever change? Yeah. And I think it doesn't this, need to. Right. And I think what was the SANS top 20, which I know is shifted now. Yeah. I don't think that's radically changed in the last no, not 20 years. Right. And, and so what he said then is that, uh, and I think that this was actually pretty good. Uh, I think this is the thrust of, of what, he, what he focuses on. Um, I'll quote from, if you boil it down, what we're trying to accomplish in security is to act as a barrier between devs, business folks, ops, and others, and keep them from doing something stupid. Now, to be fair. I love, I love that. He's got, yeah. de he's got a stick figure of dev. <laughs> he's got infosec in the middle, and then he's got the word stupid. Right yeah, inside. And, right? And, I mean and, that's Yeah. No, it's it's good. But there's I gotta say, there is a piece of me that looks at that and goes, Yeah, but that's also kind of reinforced. 
forcing the notion that we're there to protect everybody and to be the barrier. And, and, uh, and that's not where we need to be. And that, but I think that's what he was getting to eventually is we need to not be a barrier. And he's certainly written about that in the past. But I like how he would go back to System 1 and System 2, right? System 1 is 2 plus 2. System 2 is 18 times 23. Right. And he's like, you know, in security, we're all about System 2 thinking. Yep. Like the whole time. Like developers are all about System 1 thinking. Like how do I solve the problem in the fastest, quickest way possible, intuitive? I got deadlines, man. Like my bonus is riding on. I'm getting this out. And we in security sitting there back going, well... What about your risk assessment? You know, what about your code review and penetration test and, and all that stuff? And that, that, that's one of the huge, that really succinctly talks about the huge disconnect between especially developers and security. Well, yeah, and, and circle it back to the, to the conversation with John before, right? I mean, and, and, and broaden this out. And this is what I liked about this was when you broaden out, what, what he's done with this piece is he gave us another lens to look at security. He gave us a, a different way. He's taken an exceptionally popular piece of literature that has a lot of insights to how we process and make decisions. And he said, look, a lot of people are making um, you know, fast, rapid, emotional decisions. And, and by the way, just so we're clear, I don't think emotional decisions are bad decisions. I think most decisions yeah. are emotional decisions. Yep. And we're looking at it much more esoterically and more thoughtfully or, or whatever. Um, Right. So go back to it. So people that are already working 40, 50 hours a week or more uh, that have a ton of uh, constraints on them and a ton of pressure on them, if we're trying to get them to engage in this type two thinking all the time. Right. And so, so you know, m maybe I skipped over it if it's in here, but, but here's the conclusion that I drew from this that I, and that I really liked about it. We need to stop saying people don't understand that they're, they're too stupid. They're the weakest link. They'll never. No. I mean, I think what this kind of lays out for us really well is to say, if the world's operating in system one and we're operating in system two, uh, I'll use my words, not his. Maybe it's not them that needs to change, right? It's just it, I don't. Know, I think it's. A, I think I think there's a lot of really good stuff here to think about. I also think this is a, the kind of thing that you know. Yeah, it's it's printed out. It's like four pages, and it's the kind of thing that you got to read and you got to think. Right? You got to use a uh, system two to get through this. And then mm. think about it a little bit more. That, that's not, a, that's not a, a, a criticism. It's just a statement. Kevin, did you see this article? I know Mike and I, have been, we've been going back and forth a lot. Yeah, uh, and, and it, it, this kind of actually touches back on what John was talking about. One of the hardest challenges I think all of us and probably most of our, our viewers uh, experience on a, a daily basis is the translation of what we know to people who don't know. It's system one versus system two. We see things in this very technical way. They see things in mm. a way that has to work. So it's that, uh, and as John kind of gave that a great example of the spaces uh, of his, his yeah. uh, able to show the actual context and the value of data in the way that we see things as, as security practitioners and, and privacy to someone who doesn't understand the context of the value of that data. That is the biggest challenge. And I think that's what this article was really trying to drive is this is one of our biggest challenges. How do we give context to what we see and understand about the value of data to someone who doesn't have that context? That, it is one of the hardest challenges. <laughs> Sorry, I Israel was penetration testing one of our chairs and figured out how to make it. Yeah, they're not the highest quality chairs we have here in the studio. They're hand-me-downs. I apologize You're beginning for that. a report. That's right. <laughs> we need an assessment report on our chairs. Will it, will it be humble? <laughs> yes. What, now, what did you think? I, in, I, I know it's kind of cliche, but what did you think about the Sun Tzu quote in the article? I mean, aside from, all right, so the, the quote is, build your opponent a golden bridge to retreat across. I think it's a good, I mean, you know, I know that it's popular now to mock people who quote Sun Tzu, but the reason that that has stood a test of time is there's a lot of wisdom in it. Yeah, and, I thought and, this was a pretty good usage of the, the Sun. Yeah, and, I don't. And it, but every time I talk about Sun Tzu, I think of the Sopranos episode where Paulie was calling it Sun Tzu. And when people <laughs> reference that in their presentations at work, I send them that link to that YouTube video. And I'm like, dude, no, you're not using Sun Tzu. But <laughs> I'm like, you're just not, right? But Gunnar, Gunnar actually does, does, a nice, does a nice job. Well, and, and I think what he laid out really well is to say, how do, how do we build better relationships? The answer is you make it easy. Mm -hmm. you, you don't chastise somebody for, for whatever system they happen to be thinking in. And, and I think that's what Kevin was just saying and, and what John started out with. You know, I mentioned this before. I'll just I'll point it out again if people are interested. They can go look it up. It's called the WASON, W-A-S-O-N, Selection Task. 
Yeah, it was from the sixties. The, wa- the Wasson is that a, is that a sex toy, Mike? Is no, that- I, I think oh. it's a dance. Oh, no, okay. The Watusi. I get so confused with these things. <laughs> um, but but basically, the point is, it's it's a logic puzzle, and it has to do with context. And if you go to something, in fact. I, I'm willing to bet. Now, this is me just to, uh, going off the cuff. So, I somebody who's like really smart is probably gonna be like, "No, Michael, you got that totally wrong." But I'm looking at this going. Basically, if you give somebody a type two type of thing, but you time them on it really fast, they fail at an alarming rate. Mm-hmm. If you turn it into a type or a system one type of exercise, they succeed at an alarming rate. And and so you know what's great about this particular article is it gives us a better way to look at what we're doing. So if, if we're putting out information and asking somebody to use a, a, a system too, to, to process it, to think about it, mm-hmm. to make better decisions, very NPR style. And, and they're into shock, shock morning, you know, or ESPN. Hey, let's yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. Then, then of course there's a disconnect. By the way, it doesn't mean anybody's wrong. I think that's the, like, for me, this is the takeaway. Nobody's wrong. Mm. It's just not matched up. I, and I then you've got son to zoo and he's going to help. <laughs> I think this um, is the best blog post of the year, hands down. Good thing it's really near. No, wait. Don't we do that now? Think, like we give out awards I think in it's the, the beginning blog, of the year for I the I think whole it's year. the best blog post in the past 12 months. I just heard him drop the mic. He's done. I, you know, I, I, I don't know how you top that, to be honest with you. Gunner, <laughs> Gunner may be the person who can, but I, I love the, the, the access to soda, right? And he's got the picture of the kid, and the arrow goes to mom. And then the other arrow goes to soda. And the kid's not getting soda, right? And then the next graphic is the kid. It goes to Homer Simpson. And he goes to soda. And then this arrow's back to him in a picture drinking soda, right? And it's all about, like, finding the weakest guard, right? So it kind of speaks to me about user awareness, right? And some of the problems that we have with user awareness training is that you could train all your users, conceivably all your users, right? But they're going to find, the attackers are going to find the weakest guard. Man, I, I, I feel like sometimes it's sport to get me riled up. Let me just make a quick comment on the awareness thing for a while. <laughs> no, because, because it, it just because again, right? Just like Gunther's gone, Gunner's gone to this great uh, opportunity here to like really define the terms, and, and we keep saying this term awareness and security, and I just want to keep banging my head against the window and say that doesn't mean what you think it means. There is no usage of the word awareness except for in security, where it means. You recognize, understand, and act. Awareness in anything simply means it's a recognition. Mm-hmm. There, there's no understanding required. And so, so when I see these elaborate security awareness programs or awareness and training or awareness and training and education or whatever they want to call them, I'm, I'm getting to the point where it's kind of like, guys, there is one single outcome from a successful awareness program. Somebody realizes something and goes, I don't think that's right, and they call. They, I don't know, they text, they go to the website, they send an email. That's it. That's it. If you, if you could get a program that just does that, somebody recognizes, right, they're aware that something might not be right, and they feel comfortable enough understanding the process to solve that problem, to, to alert somebody who should know what to do, awesome. And then there's a whole bunch we can do after that, but, but that's, that's really kind of it. However, it, it raises your point. Um, I want to make one other quick point, too, because it... And, and, I, and I mean this with, with all uh, deference and respect. As a, as a professional speaker, when I see that we're using copyrighted images from other people, whether it's in a blog post or a presentation, um, all I'm going to say is, unless you've got a license to do that, please don't. We're in security. We're supposed to have integrity. We're supposed to protect intellectual property and respect it properly. And fair use, I know a lot of people like to claim it, it's a very gray area. Um, so it's cute to have Homer Simpson in there. I, I'm, I'm guessing, um, that wasn't licensed. The, so law, just, the lawyer in me will make a case for fair use on Homer Simpson, dude. Yeah. And, and the judges will decide it. It's a, because it's a parody in my mind. In which it's case. Not the point, and it's not the full, uh, point of the article is to talk about Homer Simpson, right? He's using it in parody. I know. I just I, I see a lot of people at conferences. We can both slides. pretend to be lawyers and, and hash that out. But this will be a lot of maybe fun. a lawyer. Maybe a lawyer will come by and tell us no. He's he's look, wrong. But look, I, Paul, I have I'm a, a looser train lawyer, so I know what <laughs> yeah. I'm talking about. I have a I looser interpretation of fair use. I don't know. I've been in media for ten years. I have a looser interpretation of fair use. 
Yeah. Mostly that's... because the show we produce, we put on the internet for free and anyone can use it. So, anyway. I'm not going to disagree. Thanks for taking us down that segue, Mike. You're welcome. <laughs> I just, you know. Can we Thanks go back to talking sure. about IoT now or something? Because that's our... Good Lord. I don't know. Where do we want to go next? Uh, speaking of IoT, did you see the, the NIST draft that was put out? No, I did not. I thought you were going to say, did you see the D-Link patch that really wasn't a patch but introduced yet another vulnerability? Because oh, well, that makes me sad. That's nothing new. <laughs> no, the... <laughs> <laughs> so there, there's a draft that was Got just published very recently of uh, NIST 800-160, I believe, mm -hmm. that essentially can be boiled down to uh, IoT is indefensible. That, and this what? is coming from a NIST publication. And it is essentially the, the point it's trying to make is that uh, the answer to this is actual regulation. Oh, there you go. Well, you there just you go. The yeah, point. yeah. It's, you can't it, possibly it, secure it, so therefore we must heavily regulate it. It, it, the, there is a little bit of irony there, but mm -hmm. it, it does kind of it, it kind of encapsulates a lot of what we've been talking about, where the onus of responsibility comes from from cloud providers, from IoT device providers. They have to be held responsible of building a product that the average user who does not have the awareness of what they are doing to actually make it secure. When you have firmware that is upgrading itself without authenticating, whose responsibility is that? The person who went to Target to buy the device? or the cloud provider who's selling you that solution. No, I, I agree that we need to solve that problem and that the onus falls on the vendor. I just don't necessarily agree we need regulation to say that they have to. I don't know, maybe we do, maybe we don't. Well, we can that kick and scream all, all we want, but that's not going to change that provider's mentality of ship it, ship it, ship it. If it doesn't break and there aren't enough people complaining about yeah, it. Yeah, but PCI said if you're doing... Trent, never mind. But PCI <laughs> doesn't have a legal requirement really behind it. It's a framework. Well, yeah. Well, hold on, though. Well, PCI has uh, the, if you're not, if you don't do this, then we, we, you don't get to use our cards. It's best right. practices. It, it, but it, I hope you used air quotes on the best because there's I nothing did. best I about did, thank yeah. You. yeah. But, you know, he, here's the broader thing I look at. Um, I, I always like to play this question, but what's the real harm? I know we did the thing last week where, you know, the, somebody looked in at the kid in the crib, and that's really bad, horrible, yes. and shocking. But, but you know, I, I think what starts to happen is that, right, again, right, when we're looking at it using system two, we say, well, I mean, it's just that today, but it could be. In, in our brain, we've got 50,000 really bad, horrible, terrible, completely bad scenarios. So far, what we've seen that people can demonstrate in court from an actual harm perspective, yeah, it's not there. It's, it's pretty low. And, and so what I look at then is I go, that, that doesn't mean we need regulation. That just means we need to engage in better conversations and we need to start helping people using all the stuff we've already talked about today, right? Context. We set the right context. We lay out the scenarios. Do you want scenario A, B, or C? And then my favorite now is instead of telling them as I get to say, well, how do you guys do it today? And what if these things happen? And what would, you, what would make you upset? And you go, okay, cool. And then you ask that enough and you learn. And then we get to tell the stories. And we get to see what people want. And as we do that... Then we can go back to the to the distributors. I think John actually nailed it perfect, and I'm really I'm really glad for his insight. It's not about saying to the companies, "Do this with the angry, shaky fist." We're smarter. We're type two, system two thinkers, and you're not. Uh, it, it's it's looking at them saying, "Hey guys, look, Apple nailed this, and people will pay a premium for their devices." Right? I mean, Walmart makes an average annual profit of 3%, and Apple's like 23, 25%, 26%. Um, now, by the way, everybody still goes to, to Walmart or, you know, look at any uh, oil company. Most of the oil companies are between, well, before oil dropped, they were between 3 and, and 8%. Um, people still buy gasoline, right? So, so the thing to it is people will pay a premium for a better designed product that delivers them what they want with less hassle and quote unquote security. We just need to think about how we do it that way. Once the government gets involved, it's what I, I, I keep threatening to write this paper. It's the fallacy of controls. Controls just create more opportunities for people to circumvent the controls. That's all it does. We need, we need some controls and legislation around posting passwords on <laughs> sticky notes. I That's was just going to ask about that because I am so curious what you guys think of this story. Is this the hacked French network exposes its own passwords during a TV interview? Oh, no. I thought we were going to go down to the, to the school. Let's start with oh, that. So, Let's start with the hacked French network. Yeah. So they were, they, the, the staffer's desk was behind the guy they were interviewing, and their passwords 
for like social networks like YouTube and Twitter were up behind them. I don't know. I just think that's funny. I, it, it, what, you know what's even funnier is that one of the passwords uh, was A Z E R T Y one two three four five. Does anyone know what that is? On a on a French keyboard, that's the equivalent of QWERTY one two oh. three four five. I thought that was funny. Hopefully, people are in their cars listening to this laughing. Anyway, there's not much more there other than that. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, I mean, don't, uh, you don't know, write your. I mean, it comes back to the password thing. Like, don't write your passwords down. I mean, but it, it goes yeah. even further back to the, the the context of the value of information. It's. The, the, I'm sure that person probably sat through a two hour awful PowerPoint presentation about security awareness training. That's right. Where they They've walked been away saying. Training. Whatever, that's never going to happen to me without realizing, yeah. oh, that is going to happen to you because that, you put the password behind you on camera. No, wait, you wrote the password down. There is where we're failing to provide the context. What I want to know is if you have a, the password equivalent of QWERTY12345, why do you have to write it down? Don't, don't you Amen make it that. like yeah. that so <laughs> you don't have to write it point. down? You know, the thing is, though, and I've had a number of people in the last couple of years proudly tell me how they're writing their passwords down. And, um, and, but, but then they give me the, the rationale. And they, some of them do these really elaborate obfusc obfuscation techniques on their written down passwords. And a lot of them have them in their wallet. And they're like, look, if you got this from me, then <laughs> you, you getting the passwords is the least of my concerns. Um, whether we like that or not, I'm, I'm okay with somebody writing it down. I think there's a broader question, though. So wait a minute. They were using social media, and they had the passwords not just written down but posted. Ah, so we didn't give them an effective mechanism to share those accounts. We didn't give them an effective mechanism to successfully and easily authenticate themselves, especially once you get to two two factor, which clearly that, that didn't seem to be their concern. But it's like you know, like I look at it, and everybody goes, "Oh, effing idiots." I mean, this will happen again, by the way, too, right? By the time uh, MLB is starting up now, baseball, right? And we get to football. And there'll be some interview with somebody and they'll be like, look, they had the Wi-Fi password on the wall. Wi-Fi. Yeah, look, guys, I've been to those stadiums. They give that stuff out to the reporters. That's mm -hmm. not a – it's always oh, it on TV. Trust me, nobody cares. The French network giving out the social media accounts, that's a little, a little bit different. more. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that's a different level. But, you know, what we do is the same thing. We, we shame and blame. Ah, it, but I didn't hear anybody say, well, why did they do that? And, and did they have a viable alternative? And, and did they understand it? And did we make it easier for them to do anything other than that? Because, by the way, what I just described, some sort of a system that allowed them to authenticate. Yeah, okay, so how much does that cost versus uh, printing out a sheet of paper with the password on it? I is, mean, now. Israel, we, when, when you're doing security in Israel, was there people writing down passwords or was that? Because of the higher level of security, they would assume that I've read about in your country, right? Or do you still see that kind of behavior? So it's, uh, I think it's common everywhere. You know, mm -hmm. I think uh, one of the projects I led um, in the Israel Defense Forces was um, replacing the soldier ID with a smart ID, mm -hmm. right? A, a smart card, uh, a biometric smart card or a, or a pin-based smart card. So mm -hmm. they would be able to use that instead of their passwords. Uh, so what people did they left their card in the card reader and had the pin code uh, written on a sticky note stuck on their computer. <laughs> yeah. And what happened is sometimes those cards fell out of the readers. Mm -hmm. So they used duct tape, right, <laughs> to attach the, the card to their readers. So, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's technology yeah. and education. Yeah, yeah. Right, and that's because we, we, we put these things up as a barrier. The more we make it a barrier, the more people will find clever ways around our barriers. We're not integrated. We're not showing them the benefit of it. You know, I've had people say to me, well, PIN codes aren't, aren't a benefit. They sure as hell are. If you don't want your bank account emptied, then that PIN code is not a barrier. That PIN code is what's the difference between going – I mean, what are bankers hours today from 10 o'clock until 1 o'clock with a two-hour break for lunch, right? I mean, you know, you want to go to an actual bank and talk to somebody to get your money out? But go ahead. Oh, wait, we'll give you this little card and you can get your money 24 hours a day. By the way, for that level of convenience, there's some risk associated with it. We'd like you to remember four, four digits. I mean, come on. That, that today, what, 10,000 unique characters? What is that to break? Four, four seconds less, right? I mean, I, I don't know. I, I think that we have historically presented it as 
the internet is bad, firewalls are good, and everything we do is good to keep out the bad. We're the protectors. We're going to block. We're going to stop. We use very strong language uh, that just gets people to go, well, screw you. Bye. And I, th- I think we need to stop. But let's let's flip it then. So eighth so grade, charged- yeah, an eighth grade uh, boy was charged in Florida with a felony computer intrusion. Felony. Now, I've been doing the show 10 years now, roughly. It'll be 10 years this October. Every time I've seen one of these stories, you and your initial like social uh, reaction is, "Oh my God, that's horrible!" Like this poor young kid is being charged with a felony computer intrusion. Like ninety nine percent of the time, when you actually read through the article, you find that there's more to the story, right? And that the yeah. person who you feel bad for just reading the headline usually turns out to be kind of a jerk. And when you read through this article, you get to the sentence about a th- you know halfway down that says that this 14-year-old boy had, boy had previously received a three-day suspension for accessing the system inappropriately. And there almost often is a case. Like, this isn't the first time this student broke into something without permission. And when he does it, like, the eighth time or whatever, they say, well, now we're charging you with a felony because you're causing trouble. So there's almost always a backstory here. This case is kind of weird. He was shoulder surfing, got a password, and put a picture of two men kissing on his teacher's computer. Does that deserve? I don't know. The law is the law, right? I mean, the fact that the school is describing this article as having weak passwords doesn't matter, right? The law is the law, which is kind of an interesting take on this story, is that um, a felony is a felony. It doesn't matter how insecure the organization is. A computer felony is a computer felony. Even if all their passwords are QWERTY1234, that doesn't matter. Uh, it doesn't he just needed to say he was a security researcher. Ring the bell and walk away. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's that. I don't know if he'll claim that defense. But nah, he missed his uh, apparently there was other students that did it too. Unfortunately, that's not a valid defense for him either. Oh. No. Um, yeah. Well, there's, there's a follow-up story. Uh, it got posted Tuesday. Uh, so this isn't, I mean, it's not fresh today. Mm-hmm. But, but here's some of the other stuff. So once he was in the network, he accessed his friend's computer screens, played with their onboard cameras, uh, tried to place a pornographic image onto a teacher's desktop. Uh, you know, I mean, th- this wasn't... <sighs> You know, it's like I feel like we all watched Ferris Bueller's Day Off and went, oh, <laughs> yes. if you could get in yes. and you could fake them and you could change your grades, that's just kids being mischievous. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I got to tell you, I, I, um, I'm not sh- – felonies, felonies, I mean that's – that escalated quickly. But at the same time, I, I, when I watch people go, he's just a kid. It's a harmless prank. No. Wait, did you mean Ferris Bueller's Day Off or War Games or both? I meant Ferris Bueller's Day Off because okay. there's this scene where he goes in to try to change his grades. It is War both. Games would probably yes. would have been apt. Yeah, that's that's probably the same or a better analogy for us. But you know, like I'm just I'm just kind of looking at this thing, going, I don't think the legal like I I'm not one of the people who says, oh, the laws are stupid. Although coincidentally, the laws probably are stupid. Um, I, a felony for this? I, I don't know. That makes me nervous. Same time, kids being kids. I don't know. I didn't do stuff like this in in, in school. Uh, oh, it's just a harmless prank. You you wanted to put a pornographic image on the guy's computer. You screwed with your friend's computers. You play with their onboard cameras, and you put a picture to him and kissing. This kid's lucky he didn't get arrested for a hate crime. I mean, this is this is I don't know. I don't I don't see this as a harmless prank. I I see this mm-hmm. as the beginning of something that that's not good. Well, let's back up for a second. Give a little context. I mean, did we grow up with high, with computers in high school? Mm-hmm. Fair enough. Well, it's it's, well, it's kind I, of I hard to, to Mike, to you're kind of you're kind of old. I had I had computers I in in high school. But. I had a Vic twenty. I, and by I the time had... the end of high school, that's when we had the two eighty six. Remember the two eighty six premium? That's I had a AST two eighty six. Like for my last two years. Of well, high they school. weren't but, they weren't great computers, but we had computers. <laughs> all right, all right, fair enough, but the the pranks you could pull on a computer back Kevin, then. Kevin, you probably had four eighty sixes or something when you were in. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I was in the middle of the woods. I didn't have anything. Oh, okay. <laughs> you had the Pentium chip, baby. This <laughs> <laughs> gets good. Um, but you have to. Imagine, I mean, kids do stupid stuff. And, yeah, that's fair. And now they have the ability to do a lot more stupid stuff on, on an electronic or technical level. Uh, 
a felony? I, I mean, yeah, how is this How is this different, though, if you went into the teacher's locker and left a picture of pornography? Because I Is think that a felony? I, 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 no, I, I'm not going to get into some kind of legal argument. But well, here, I, I'm playing lawyer. I'm not Appar- a lawyer, but let me go yeah. Google it, then we'll argue with lawyers. <laughs> yeah. so look at the but, but with this, this actually kind of comes back my to... De- I hope my Google. lawyer would make that defense for me anyway. <laughs> I got to Google this. This kind of comes back to right we were just talking about, the context of the, uh, of the situation when it comes to privacy, when it comes to security. When the kid places an image in, a, in his teacher's locker, I think he understands what he's doing. When you're logging into a desktop remotely, do you still have the same kind of context and understanding that I'm doing something incredibly illegal? Yes. We, yeah, I, I'm but sorry. It, I'm not going to make like, that leap. But isn't like accessing the locker illegal too? No? Yeah. Should be. Depends. Be, but the, are, when you access some of your teacher's locker, are you going to go to a federal prison? Yeah, and that's my point. That's it's, my point. It, I mean, to put it, it we, in context, just because a computer was used, like, I feel like just because a computer's used, it was automatically right. a felony. I, I, I'm not going to dis- – yeah, I, th- that's where I said I, I, I think this is – I get nervous when people go, it's just a kid being a kid. Yeah, yeah you got to be careful no. with that. I agree with you, Mike. You do but have to be careful side, with that. But on the other side, felony? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I, I, right? I, 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 it's, it's like that bit from uh, – what's a federal pound me in the ass prison? What? No. Yeah, no. It's yeah. Not, I'm not disagreeing with you here, but what I'm saying is the ramifications of doing things just because it's a computer should never equal you're going away for X number of years and you can never get a job. Yeah, that's not doing that kid yeah. any favors either. Like, make the kid teach computers or something or do something constructive it's, with – he's 14. Do something constructive with that punishment. Don't just charge him with a felony. That's what I think. Well, you know, and it's funny. Like, I'm, I'm looking at uh, the article, too. It's, a, you know, to me, this is just – silly quote one of the computers uh, accessed allegedly contained encrypted questions to the fcat the florida comprehensive assessment test oh i'm sure he was going after that look oh, yeah, I, yeah. this is where i agree this was definitely much more of a prank this was a kid going he didn't he didn't try to change he wasn't trying to, to steal test questions he wasn't trying to change his grades he was jerking around with his buddies and he was screwing with the teacher mm-hmm. I get that side of it, and I get you know, and so I maybe I'm arguing against myself. That's great. All right, that's why I'm not a lawyer, I guess. Uh, I think it's interesting. I you know I I think this is where I, I'd like for us to kind of have more debates about stuff. Um, the same time, then kids need to understand that this is bad. I, I can't think he he didn't think that this was bad. Um, well, he probably knew it was bad. I mean, we all did stupid stuff in high school, and we knew it was bad, but we did it anyway because we were stupid in high school. Yeah, so he really got caught. Not to so play you didn't stupid. Here I know I looked at you when I said that. It's not to play you didn't <laughs> stupid well, in high school. Nice but but doing yeah. things stupid yeah. in high school, can you really think you're going to get sent to prison because like a, you use yeah, a computer? I'm, I'm with That's, you on that. It's, it's funny that we, we brought up war games. We're talking about laws that were designed and explicitly put into law because of the movie War Games. My That's parents right. wouldn't let me have a modem after we watched War Games. Damn it. And it, I'm still bitter it, to this day. Yeah, about we're that too. we're still talking about the ramifications of that movie, and now some kid might go to prison because of it. Well, it's, I mean, it, it it does say he's not. They said he doesn't even think he's going to go to trial. They think he's just they're uh, just going to. Uh, stop ruining my argument, argument here, okay? I'm sorry. No, it's a good argument. I'm, my bad. <laughs> it's all right. You keep going. I'm going to be totally with you, arguing with you. Like I've uh, I've changed my position five times now. Listen, <laughs> you have. It, but, you have. It, it, I'm kind of dizzy right now. <laughs> me too. <laughs> It's, it's, oh, I, you know what? I think that's the cocktails. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. We're, we we're, um, we're kind of out of time. Um, so that's all we have time to talk about. We, you know what? If we didn't talk about stories that you, everyone feels very strongly about, we'll deal with those next week. So <laughs> we're gonna, I hear the music, so we're going to take a short break and come right back. Welcome back, everyone. I want to thank our special in-studio guest, Israel Barak. Thank you very much for being here. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, yes. Paul. I'm glad uh, you survived your first Security Weekly <laughs> episode. You're more than welcome to come back anytime. Thank you so much. You're in the local area. And we'll see you at Source, Boston. Yep. Have fun at RSA. Uh, be well, fun. Mike will be. Mike, will you be out there at RSA? No, I, I'm, uh, I'm going to bunker down here at the beach. 
I, I can't say that I blame you. Kevin will be at RSA. I will be at Make RSA. Make sure you go, go to the Pony Express booth. Yeah, please. Come they're visit all us. awesome people. See you they're there. all good friends of mine. We're going to awesome. be uh, we're going to be showing off some pretty cool stuff. Let me just tell you. You got new stuff you're showing at RSA, Kevin? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys are always cagey about that. It's pretty funny. It's pretty funny. You're very, you hold it I got to keep you on your toes. That's right. That's right. Well, awesome. Yeah. Make sure, you know, if you're going to RSA, that you stop by all of our sponsors' booth. And are you going to, are you, you're exhibiting at RSA? Yes, we're actually announcing a third version of the product there. Excellent. So yep. go, go see Israel at RSA and all of our sponsors. It'll be great. And I'll be here in Rhode Island. So. <laughs> Yeah, think Excellent. about that, dude. You'll be shoveling snow. And no, it's not. It's gr- we get the doors and windows open in the studio. Mm. It's beautiful out. And just wait till tomorrow. Yeah, well, then, yeah, if you don't like the weather in New England, wait <laughs> till tomorrow. Well, with that, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Kevin. And we'll see everyone next week. Over and felony or not felony, out. <laughs> That's a horrible shot of the bar, by the way. Like, you can only see the tops of the bottles and Frank milling around. Mm